Today I'll be making this cult altar using a Halloween costume sword as the focal point. Hey everyone, Gabriel with Gabriel Sabi Studio here. If you enjoyed this content, please like and subscribe, and make sure that you stick around to the end of the video for a question that I have for you. To save some time and promote the creative process, I've already cut the sword into pieces and selected some scrap pieces of foam that will make the base of this terrain. When I first started to plan this project out, I knew right away that I wanted the sword point to be an obelisk, but I wasn't too sure about anything after that. I was thinking maybe it's a tomb or some kind of buried architecture, and just played around holding the pieces in different fashions to get an idea of what it could look like. While manipulating these two halves, I saw that the one symbol in the middle lined up really closely with the other one, if I put them together, I could make a larger rune wall. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Enough blabbering, more crafting. To give the whole altar some inflated purpose, I decided to put the whole structure on a platform and create some stairs leading up to it. I thought that later on I could find some way of limiting the access, so that way it designates the stairs are the preferred method, but that's not the only way up. To create the stairs, I just scored into the foam and then began chipping away trying to make some stair-like shapes that I could then go back into with some popsicle stick slivers and create the actual steps that would be walked on. Because this is a Halloween costume sword, it's just a hollow piece of plastic. When cut into pieces, it doesn't really have a lot of contact area. So I'm going to have to fill in some of these spaces with some scrap bits of foam in order to have enough area to glue this onto the wall. For this, I took some EVA foam that I had left over and just cut and shaved so that way I could fit that into the recess, and then I could use that to glue the whole thing onto the wall. And you know what? Since I had that EVA foam out, I thought, why not start building up the base around that obelisk? This turned out to be a huge waste, as I later covered that entirely with XPS foam. I could have saved myself a lot of time if I just used XPS. The original thinking for using this EVA was that it's thinner than the XPS that I have, and I didn't have my procs on yet, so I couldn't just shave pieces down to a certain thickness. After that, it's needless to say that at this point I didn't understand where I was going with that obelisk, so I put it down and went to work on the focal point of this whole piece, which is the wall and the altar itself. After finding a suitable piece to create the back wall, I laid it behind the platform to make a reference line for the height, so that way I knew where everything would go on the wall. That way I wasn't trying to glue something too far down, and then not giving myself enough space to attach the two pieces together and make sure that that's a solid connection. Placing that script section on the wall allows me to see what kind of room I'm working with. I was thinking that I could lay the skull over top of it with the teeth overlapping, but the teeth were getting in the way of that actually happening, and it could not sit flush, and thus it would not glue up too terribly easily. I had to go in and snip trim and file some of the teeth in order to get a good fit on the wall. Now, going back to the platform, it seemed a little too clean to me, and I thought I could just file all the edges down and blend them in, but that seemed to be more tedious and time-consuming than I wanted it to be. It created too smooth of a texture in the small area that I tested it on. So I busted out my utility knife and began breaking off sections, just like you would with a rock formation, using V-cuts and then just ripping the foam off. I still had the EVA close at hand and wasn't completely turned off of using it at this point yet, so I used that to make the base for this pummel. I cut a hole into one of them and then made an octagonal shape around that, and I did the same to the other layer except for I didn't put a hole in the middle of it. The reason for this is so that way I could double stack them, one is a little bit bigger than the other one, and the pummel will actually sit inside the one with a hole, and then the one that doesn't is the bottom piece. Knowing where the skull was going allowed me to see where I could put other textures to break up that uniform texture of the foam. I cut up some serial card and zip ties, along with some of that pattern from the EVA, in order to add some variety to the surface and make it a little more visually appealing. 
The use of a zip tie is a really quick and easy way of making something look a little bit more industrial because of the repeated pattern on it. With those textures on the wall, I then went to attach the skull. And at this point, I realized that the wall was not going to be tall enough. But I didn't actually do anything about it yet. I figured I'll get to it later. Using something that's assembled in two halves and held together with screws is actually really convenient when you break it apart because those little pins or the little screw holes are perfect for putting in a toothpick or some other kind of rod so that way you can pin it to your surface. That's exactly what I did with the skull. I took some uh, barbecue skewer bits and glued them into the screw holes and then used that to pin the skull to the foam. By now, I've already realized that the EVA was not going to work with that obelisk, so I went back in and attached some XPS to make it thicker and give the base more substance. I was thinking that this piece could fit in with the cult altar, but I could also use this in other genres if I didn't make the floor have a modern look, and I made it with the kind of generic brick look so I could use it in multiple genres. For this generic brick look, I just traced out some even spacing for the bricks and then went back in to give them some overlapping texture. I tried to get this to work with just a pencil and a pen and some other things, but it wasn't quite working. You know what, I'll just have to come back to that later. I'll figure something else out. I'm going to be attaching some posts and I'll explain why I'm doing that later. So off camera here, I've already attached the next segment of the wall, and I'm just going to be breaking up the textures on this part of it now. Again, I'm bringing in some zip tie and some of that serial card, and then I'll be carrying this stone texture that I did up the rest of the wall. So it was at this point that I got incredibly impatient and frustrated with the foam for not reacting the way that I'm used to it. And I decided to use a wood burner to speed the process up. This was kind of a mistake for the obelisk, but it worked out perfectly fine for everything else that I used it on. The only reason that it didn't work for the obelisk was that I wasn't careful about the angle that I was going in, and some of those little brick areas are undercut pretty badly. But the wall itself came out pretty nicely, and then the rivets that I put on the pummel section worked really well. You know, speaking of rivets, let's take a moment to talk about one of my favorite tools for making rivets. This is a leather punch. Uh, it has a variety of different sizes that you can punch out of leather, of course. But you can also use this with cereal card and other paper goods. Now, because this has a variety of different sizes, I only need one of these instead of having multiple different punches of different sizes. To attach these rivets to the wall, I just put a little super glue off to the side, so that way I can use that to glue the rivets to the surface. How I'm picking up the rivets is by stabbing each one with the tip of my hobby knife and then dipping it into the super glue and attaching it to the surface. Picking up these tiny rivets this way is incredibly easy compared to trying to use tweezers or your fingers to pick them up. At this point, the wall doesn't quite seem modern enough. It's too bare. I need to add some more detail. I'm going to add a smattering of small pipes. We're just going to make that by bending up some paper clips to make the smaller diameter ones. And for the larger ones, I'll be using some plastic tubing that I've just cut in half. You know, while we're at it, let's add some wires and some other little things on here as well. So uh, how about some picture hanging wire, uh, some kind of loose cabling, then I can put some other plastic tubes on here. You know, let's take some of these plastic gears from the hobby store and put that on there to break up some of that blank space. Looking at it, it just doesn't seem quite right. I wanted it to be a little more... I can go ahead and add some kind of flowing ooze from these pipes. We'll just take the hot glue and we'll make sure to overfill the area right below the pipe so that way the hot glue can then drip down the wall. Or if it drips just right, it'll skip the wall entirely and fall onto a lower section of the terrain. I do want to give you a few tips here before moving on to priming. If you're working with this XPS foam, it has a tendency to be eaten by the accelerant that's in spray paint. To prevent this, I'm just going to take some Mod Podge and cover all of the exposed foam surface. If you're careful enough, you can go ahead and spray the foam and get good coverage on it without ruining the texture of the foam, but I prefer just to be safe than sorry. 
Mod Podge is a material akin to PVA, however it's got a sealer in it as well. Now if you don't have Mod Podge, you can go ahead and just use PVA glue, and it'll have basically the same effect, it's just the Mod Podge is better for this task than PVA. The Mod Podge that I'm using, I've added some black paint into it, just so that way I have a visual indicator of where I've got good coverage. If there are any areas that show up really closely or exactly the original color of the foam, then I know that I have missed a spot. If it's tinted darker in any fashion, then I know I've got some coverage there. One priming session later, and I have the obelisk and pummel primed black and the walls primed gray. Let's go ahead and start with the stone. I'm just going to be using a variety of different brown colors from a dark raw umbery type color all the way up to a tan color. With that done, we can then go ahead to the other areas and base coat them. For the wall with the script on it, I'm going to use a kind of pseudo wet blending technique, probably more akin to overbrushing and dirty mixing, but whatever. But what I'm doing is I'm taking a darker gray and putting it into the bottom of the wall area where the shadow would line up, and then a lighter gray on top where the light would be hitting it. Then I'm taking those two colors and moving them in towards the middle and then blending them together. The base coat for the skull is going to be done in the Malice or Malal motif, with one half of it being white and the other half of it being black. For these industrial wall areas, it's a little bit trickier. I'm going to be painting in not one solid color, but a variety of different colors, so that way I can create a multitude of tones and effects. We'll just go ahead and start by stippling on a sickly yellow-green color. I'm not going to be covering the entire thing, but more so the inside of these spaces. I'm making sure to leave some area around the edges, so that way I can come in with my other colors in a moment. Now I'm using a stippling motion here so that way the brush strokes don't show up. I want any kind of physical marks made by brush strokes to be intentional. I don't want these to show up unless I'm doing something for weathering. Following up that sickly yellow green, we'll go ahead and take a mix of brown and green and we'll just go ahead and jam those into those areas that we've not painted with a sickly yellow green. We're going to quickly stipple in some neutral purple into those areas, and that way we can have a variety of tones. The pipes and cables, and those are just going to get different black, red, green. Some of them I'm going to paint some kind of metallic color, maybe. And the last thing before I go ahead and finish up here is dry brushing everything. All of the stone areas are going to get a tan gray color, and then an eggshell or off-white color. When I'm applying this wash, I'm going to make sure to oversaturate the top so that way I can have the liquid drip down the wall. I'm going to do this multiple times to create a layering of different shades of this wash. I do have a little bit of cleanup here that I have to do. The skull after being washed, the white areas look more brown than white and the black areas just kind of look muddy. So I'm going to go in and reapply the base coat colors. On the raised areas, I'm going to put down the base color. All of the metallic areas just get a simple black wash over them, and they don't really need anything more than that. All of those liquid effects that I made with the hot glue earlier are just going to get a base coat of that same sickly yellow green color I used for the wall, and that's the only thing that they're going to get. I'm not going to shade them at all later on. Now on to one of my favorite parts. This is where I think it starts to come together and looks a little bit more, or at least more, dramatic, because this is where the brightest areas of color are going to be placed. I'm going to take some teal and I'm going to go in and stipple that into the grooves of those symbols, making sure that the teal stippling goes outside of the grooves. That way I can follow that up with a white line inside the groove so it looks like these runes are glowing. Earlier on, I stated that I wanted the platform to be blocked off a little bit, and I wanted it to be evident that the stairs were the optimal way to get up there, but you could still get up there other ways if you wanted to. I did decide to go with a fence idea, but just simple fence posts with chains connecting them together. For this, I've got some toothpicks that I cut up to make the posts and then super glued the chain to them in some areas, and then some areas of the posts are missing or they're broken. The stone base of the obelisk is gonna get painted the exact same way that I painted the platform, 
What I did for the obelisk itself is on the upper fourth, maybe, I stippled some white. And the closer that I got to the tip of the obelisk, I made the white more opaque and less areas of the primer showing through. I then followed that up with the middle third being a light gray color, and then the rest of it that was on the bottom was all done in a very dark gray. Not quite black, but very dark gray. I then went through the boundaries on each of them and I transitioned them into one another to try and create this gradient of dark at the bottom to a more lighter color at the top. The same glowing effect that I used on the wall I'm going to use for the symbol that's at the bottom of the obelisk. There's another thing that I added here, and I briefly touched on this earlier. I've seen images of posts, pillars, flagpoles that have smaller poles around its perimeter that are anchored to it to kind of hold it together. And it's typically either a wire, a ribbon, or some kind of rope. I figured I could use that same kind of imagery here, but using chains as if these cultists put it down so they could hold it and anchor it in place so it couldn't leave or topple over. The pummel's base is getting a sporadic mix of copper, bronze, and silver. For the sphere inside of these claws, I wasn't quite sure exactly what I was going to be doing, but there's a lot of teals and greens elsewhere within these three pieces, and I figured I could use those to tie this in. I began with stippling on some blues and greens onto the orb, and then applied a yellow-green wash over the top. As specifically, I made this with green gold from Golden Fluid Acrylics. I also mixed a little bit of white in there to break it up so that way it wasn't too uniform. And the last piece of this puzzle is to wash the claws that hold the orb to the base using my terrain wash for the base and a black wash for those claws. Overall, I'm really happy with how this turned out, and now I've got a home turf terrain for my Necromunda Chaos Cultist gang. Over several of my videos, you've been seeing some previews of what my Chaos Cultists are, which are the Cult of Malice, or Malal, depending on which history you look at. Non-canon history, of course. And so these cultists have been showing up in various projects, and I think I started these roughly five, six months ago. No, it didn't take me six months because I was so meticulous painting it. It took me six months because I got sidetracked with other projects. I'd be working on my cultists and, ooh, new shiny, let's go do that. So it just took me forever to get around to finishing them. Well, good news, I finally finished my cultists and they've now got their home turf done too. You can look forward to seeing my painting process for the cultists in an upcoming video. I have a question for anyone else who plays Necromunda or has a thematic faction in any other war game. Have you made a home turf terrain or some kind of home base for your units? What was the unit or what was the gang and what did you do for their turf? It really does mean so much to me that you guys like the videos, and if you could comment, that would help out a bunch as well. It helps to make sure that YouTube's algorithms know that this is good content to share with other people who have like-minded tastes. And if you would also like to have a little bit of a heads up on what it is that I'm working on, or you would like to be able to communicate with me, you can always join my Facebook page. I'll have a link in the description below. Now, if you enjoyed this content and you would like to see more, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you can be notified when I post new content. As always, have fun, be creative, and happy hobbying.